All right, here's what I assume has to be the last ever overanalyzing disclaimer. This episode is mostly all jokes and the show overanalyzing itself, basically. So I don't know how long this video is going to be, but my mission statement for this entire series was that I'm going to say everything I want to say. So we'll see how long that takes and how long this video ends up being, I guess. Just don't flame me too hard if it's five minutes long. Doesn't it seem kind of weird that we're hiding from the Fire Lord in his own house? Top shoes aren't kicked out on the bottom once again here. Don't see why she'd fix them, so I'd say that's an error. I told you, my father hasn't come here since our family was actually happy. It seems like Zuko actually lost a lot of muscle mass over the course of the show now that I think about it. In his Agni Kai with Zhao, he was way more built than this. It makes sense too, considering he was on the road for a while, living meal to meal. You guys are not gonna believe this! There's a play about us. Here's another meta joke. The poster for The Boy in the Iceberg is a riff off the actual cover art for the release of book one on DVD. The Boy in the Iceberg is a new production from acclaimed playwright Poo on Tin. And obviously the name of the play is a reference to the title of the first episode of the show. You can actually see through this parchment again to see the artwork on the other side. I don't know why, but I really love it when they do that. It's just something they really, really didn't have to do. His sources include singing nomads, pirates, prisoners of war, and a surprisingly knowledgeable merchant of cabbage. This is a weird joke. A cabbage merchant? Everything else he just said makes sense. The singing nomads, the pirates, the prisoners of war. But what's this about a cabbage merchant? I have no idea what he's talking about. Brought to you by the critically acclaimed Ember Island players. Ugh. My mother used to take us to see them. They butchered love amongst the dragons every year. Was Zuko a big drama head in his youth? His mom took him, so he had to be pretty young. Shit, I didn't even know movies could be bad until it was like 10. I just thought everything I saw was the best movie ever. But Zuko, this guy, he has taste. Hey, uh, I wanted to sit there. Just the next to me. What's the big deal? Zuko, you're killing me, man. Is Zuko's awkwardness and lack of social awareness kind of calling back to how maladjusted he and Azula were back in the beach episode? We didn't get to see much of Zuko being awkward because he was just angry all the time, but is he just as socially clueless as Azula? Why are we sitting in the nosebleed section? My feet can't see a thing from up here. So Toph would be able to see better on the ground, on the probably equally wooden flooring. She doesn't need to be on an earth-based substance to see, it's just confirmed at this point. All I want is a full feeling in my stomach. I'm starving! So okay, like I said, explaining jokes isn't funny. It's actually like negative funny, since it steals the meaning of getting the joke. But with shitty jokes like this that are purposefully unfunny, I don't know, I'm in a weird spot here. Sokka is very food motivated at the start of the show. Shit! Toph's shoes are kicked out in this shot. Make up your mind, show. <laughs> I like that you can actually see the lines on the bald cap throughout the play. Like, it's not perfectly matched to the actress's skin tone. I don't have time to stuff my face! I must capture the Avatar to regain my honor! Alright, another behind the scenes fact. Actor Zuko is actually voiced by Dante Bosco's actual real life brother, which is pretty cool. Dante Bosco is Zuko's voice actor, by the way, if you didn't know. Let's forget about the Avatar and get massages! This could have been a verbatim line out of Iroh at one point if you think about it. Dang, that's a pretty good artist rendition of the Southern Air Temple, actually. That's good attention to detail, Ember Island Blairs. Something I personally definitely didn't notice on the first couple watch throughs, actress Aang here actually has a fake arm dangling so she can puppeteer Sock Mama. Does this dress make my butt look fat? Oh yo, check out the background of this part of the play too. You can actually see the Unagi. Man, they got all the pirates right too? Shit, if this guy had a weird heart tattoo in the back of his head, I would have been very impressed. I'm the blue spirit, the scourge of the fire nation, here to save the avatar. It's super funny that the guards in the background all just collapse when the blue spirit shows up. Other than that, yeah, this is pretty much exactly how that episode went. <laughs> Don't cry, baby. Jet will wipe out that nasty town for you! This is how most people actually see Jet, like they think this is the extent of his character. And I mean, that's not the joke in the show, but it is funny that it worked out that way. It's the Great Divide! The biggest canyon in the Earth Kingdom! Let's keep flying! And this, of course, is the most famous meta joke out of all of them. The Great Divide was panned by viewers and critics alike even back then, but this joke is probably what solidified it as the centerpiece of any bad Avatar episodes discussion. Goodbye, Sokka. I have important moon duties to take care of. Like, for example, being on a roughly 30 day cycle between full moons. That is my chief priority. Really gonna nail that one, Sokka. Apparently, the playwright thinks I'm an idiot who tells bad jokes about meat all the time. Yeah, you tell bad jokes about plenty of other topics. <laughs> Got em. They're not accurate portrayals. It's not like I'm a preachy crybaby who can't resist giving over emotional speeches about hope all the time. 
what? I mean, to be fair, she only did that like twice. I mean, I'm, well, three times if you can't fill her. You can't find an earth bending master in the sky. You have to look underground. Wait, is that John DiMaggio? It is John DiMaggio. I just looked it up. He's a big name to get for a bit part. That's kind of cool. Well, Toph, what you hear up there is the truth. It hurts, doesn't it? Are you kidding me? I wouldn't have cast it any other way. I like this moment for Toph. She just has like a really good outlook on things. If you don't forward this video to five people by midnight tonight, fourth wall break Ang will be at the foot of your bed. It's time we had a talk about your hair. It's gone too far. Maybe it's best if we split up. Was that a hair pun? Wait, what's that? I think it's your honor. Where? She escaped, but how? I mean, that is probably what happened. There was literally a door there. For as goofy as this episode is, I love this little through line of this old man doing all the backstage work. It shows a lot of methods that are actually used in theatrics, which is pretty cool. Ha ha, yes! Continue drilling! The city of Ba Sing Se can hide no longer! This part has always confused me. Is this a comment on the drill episode being boring? Because as far as I know, that one was pretty well liked back then, and it's anything but boring. No, Jack! Dude, look at actor Toff over here. Why are you stanced up like that? Did Jet just die? You know, it was really unclear. Erm, um, actually, the creators actually hard confirmed Jet's death in an episode of Avatar Extras. They just had to leave it vague because Niccolo- I've had eyes for you since the day you first captured me. This is genuinely how people that put Zuko and Katara together think, right? Just because of this line that they somehow read as flirtatious or having some romantic undertones? I need to capture him to restore something I've lost. My honor. Perhaps in exchange, I can restore something you've lost. Do they get that this joke is kind of making fun of that mindset? I thought you were the Avatar's girl. <laughs> the Avatar? <laughs> Why, he's like a little brother to me. Wait, this is exactly how the Katara and Zuko shippers talk. Is this actually a direct call out? I never thought of it that way. Get stunted on Zutara people, I guess. Well, my brother, what's it going to be? Your nation or a life of treachery? Bars! Whoa, check out this different take on the badger mole that's on the Earth King's throne in the play. Much more badger than mole in this take. Which makes sense, I suppose, since the playwright and the designers definitely haven't been to the Earth King's chambers, and they more than likely haven't seen a badger mole. I kinda like this take more. My favorite character design detail in this episode is this unimpressed smiley face that's just on the front of May's clothes. Now that is how you write and design a character. When actress Azula attacks here, you can see actress Aang actually open her eye just a little bit so she can see it and then catch it and react to it. <laughs> This scene actually reuses the music from the scene of Aang dying, which in that scene was very appropriate. In this scene... Nah, it still fits. It seems like every time there's a big battle, you guys barely make it out alive. I mean, you guys lose a lot. You're one to talk, Suki. Didn't Azula take you captive? That's right, she did! Yeah, this is like me saying, wow, that guy cares about a cartoon way too much. Have some self-awareness, Suki. I'm gonna check outside. But... What about the moon duties? I hate this play. I know it's upsetting, but it sounds like you're overreacting. Overreacting? If I hadn't blocked my chakra, I'd probably be in the Avatar state right now. That doesn't seem to have a lot to do with the play. I guess maybe there was a scene retelling his time with the guru that we didn't get to see, so that's why he's so fired up on that point right now. It just seems like a weird thing to bring up since he didn't seem to leave over that and the following conversation isn't about that at all. I got some jokes I want to give to the actor me. I'm an elite warrior who's trained for many years in the art of stealth. I think I could get you backstage. This joke has never worked for me. I don't know what it is. Maybe it just doesn't feel like Avatar humor to me. You don't get it. It's different for you. You get a muscly version of yourself taking down ten bad guys at once and making sassy remarks. Okay, well no, Zuko, that's her thing. She does do that. That's her whole thing. That's accurate. You have redeemed yourself to your uncle. You don't realize it, but you already have. How do you know? Because I once had a long conversation with the guy, and all he would talk about was you. And this is what we get for a Zuko and Toph bonding moment. It's not a whole episode, but it's still very endearing. I think it gets the job done just fine. Even if Zuko doesn't say Toph's name once in the entire show. Yeah, he doesn't, by the way, not once. But anyway, I think this is very nice and very called for, and a nice callback to a highlight of a previous episode. Good moment. Ow! What was that for? That's how I show affection. Great pick, Sokka. Say hi to that big fuzzball for me. Thank you, Katara. Ow, he really does have a heart, doesn't he? Don't ever tell her I said any of this. Your Zuko costume's pretty good. 
Put your scars on the wrong side. I didn't notice this for a long time, but this kid says this because Stage Zuko has the scar on the wrong side, and even in the promotional poster. I don't know how I didn't notice that for so long. The scar's not on the wrong side! What does the cabbage merchant use to fix his cabbages? A cabbage patch! <laughs> <laughs> who are you, anyway? I'm just a guy who likes comedy. Okay, if I ever make a third channel, that's what I'm calling it. And I thought we were gonna be together. But we're not. I like that even though this is a goofy recap episode, they still find the time to push the emotional storylines of characters forward. Like, Ang kissed Katara seven episodes ago now, and there hasn't been anything on it since then at all. It's really good that they found the time in here to mention it, otherwise the final shot could have felt a little weird. I'm just a little confused. I just said I was confused. Ah, read the room, Ang. I mean, last time you pulled that, that conversation had a good energy behind it. I could see what you were going for there. Can't pull this move right after she says she's confused, bro. That's a learning experience, I guess. Here's what you missed. We went to the Fire Nation, and you got better, and Katara was the Painted Lady. Oh yeah, the Painted Lady. It gets even less of a shout-out than the Great Divide, and I'll let you draw your own conclusions from that. And while we're on the topic, Aang has been wearing the same kind of hat that Shu from that episode was wearing. So never mind, Painted Lady, 10 out of 10, woo! And I think Combustion Man died. That's interesting, because they're about to go into the episodes about the invasion, and I'm sure you'll remember Combustion Man didn't blow himself up until shortly after the invasion. So in the play, did he die when Toph sniped him in the head with that pebble? I wonder. Hey, Toph! Would you say you and Aang have a rocky relationship? <laughs> <laughs> I told him to say that! Man, Sokka's so great. Jack Descent is a treasure. I said it a long time ago, but seriously, Sokka doesn't have a weak line read in the entire show. And you gotta give props to the animators, too. Like, look how electric Sokka is here. Actually, I'm home! And I want to join you! Wait, the Ember Island players think Zuko's best hairstyle was the short style as well? Never mind, Boy the Iceberg, 10 out of 10, woo! Father! Zuko and the Avatar are at the palace! They are trying to stop you! I love this. So since Comet has arrived and Ozai is still just sitting on his throne. Stop him from doing what? Yelling about the Comet? <laughs> This has pretty good choreography for a stage fight. Shit, say it with me. This is better than the Zuko versus Zhao fight, and it's not even a real fight. Yeah, so this play is structured super weirdly. It tells the story of the gang, but it's a propaganda play for the Fire Nation. So despite the entire play centering around the main characters, the audience is actually rooting for who was set up to be the play's antagonist. Who the fuck wrote this? Why did you think this was a good idea, Poo Wantin? So, you have mastered all four elements? I'm here, in my, uh, in my other chair. The comet is already here, and I'm unstoppable! He's yelling about the comet! Someone stop him! <laughs> Oh, and there goes the staff. The dreams of my father and my father's father have now been realized. The world is mine. It's weird, but this does set up the stakes for the finale pretty well. In this really goofy way that I think only this show could pull off and still have some gravitas behind it. That wasn't a good play. I'll say. No kidding. Horrible. You said it. But the effects were decent. He's right. I like this episode. I think it's fun. I think that's the general consensus, but there are a few people that see this as a total waste of time and a terrible episode. And I'd be lying if I didn't say I see where they're coming from at least a little bit. I think it fills a very similar role to Nightmares and Daydreams. That being, there's a very heavy episode beforehand, and we're about to get very, very serious moving on. So it's good to remind the viewers that, you know, we're still having fun. It's a really bold move to make the last episode before your four-part finale to be basically a gag episode. Personally, I think it works. I like a lot of the jokes and the meta humor and when a person or piece of media can laugh at themselves. And it's not like it's totally without merit. There's some use in reminding the audience of the journey before it comes to an end, absolutely. And it does take the time to have some heartfelt emotional conversation. It's not all nonsense. So I think it's good. I like it. Patreon shoutouts if you want to be two episodes ahead of the YouTube releases, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link as always is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons. Spurb, who knows every single way to skin a cat. Caesar's Ghost, who was given shark powers by the Shark Council. Danger Stranger, whose birth took a full calendar year, but he came out with a six-pack. Emperor Tromedlov Droma, who can drink straight-up vinegar with a straight face. Eric Barney, who was a sleeper agent for the Fifth Dimensioners. Etc., who has the same abilities as the Roman Hydra. Finnish Blood, whose bank account balance looks like a phone number. Fred Sullivan, who was wanted in 45 different states for, quote, being too good of a lover. Harrison Poland, who generates his own weather. Jared Berkman, who won a drag race on a horse he attached an engine to. John, who was actually the first to discover the New World, even before the Vikings. Mage the Mage, whose best friend is a Siberian tiger. Mishabal, 
Roblov, who has the record for destroying the most parades? Nopetron, who has the best dramatic timing when emerging from the shadows? Pran of Prem, who thankfully won Lightsaber Limbo. Sean Martin, who sleeps on a bed of spikes and likes it. Soup Cube, who made a boxcar derby car that broke Mach 1. Sulpidius, who can tie his shoes with one hand, both at the same time. The Sinking Bubble, who can speak to ghosts through rotary telephones. And you freaking nerd, who just emerged from the ocean one day in Scandinavia, otherwise no known past. Even more huge shoutouts to my other fuck you money patrons, Agent Rhino, Ben Misera, Brendan Murphy, Donnie Snow, Dylan Calvo, Dylan Roche, Garrett Kane, Honor and Cultivation, Jerry Craft, Caitlin, Kennedy Stapleton, Leif Arn Hammer, Luke Herrera, Nick Kapinen, Omega Fighter, RCNFL, Skylos, Sky Strider, Stephanie Riches, Tiago Nascimento, Varunda, and Zumpy. And of course, my god overanalyzers, Alex Fritz, Alan Garvin, Ali QPZM, Andrew Watrett, Austin Gallup, Be My Valentine, Big Thirsty, Brando Espinoza, Brand Muffin, Cameron O'Solo, Canine Corpse, Charles Barnett, Dan Bertel, David Carlisle, DJ Jax, Do Mutual Aid, Dominic Saint, Distent, Earth 2 John, Eleonora Rose, Fingal Karn, Isaiah Wilson, It's Curtain, Jacob White Cotton, Jake the Garden Rake, Jay Lambo, Jeremy Rubenstein, Jimbo, John Ajaka, Jot Moreland, Joshua Bone, Justin Scott, Kate and Connor Prendergast, Kadex, Keon Gilliland, Lady Serena, Lehman Russ, Literal NASA Rocket Scientist, Madison McCone, Matthew Stargell, Mitchell Gobrecht, Mortius 007, Nickel Pickle 582, Nicholas Abbott, Omar, Papa Jaka, Papa Parker, G -G -G Gas, Radiator Rat, Riley Booth, Rocket Mist, Shadow Fox Nero, Sky Not Darkened, Sophie Kitty, Spory, Stein One, Super Snipper, Travis Chestnut, Triad Juice, Vivina Lockfire, Wilbur, Bass Boosted, William Woolett, Wolfman Dan, Wool, and Wyatt Pence. Next up is Sosan's Comet Part 1. Hard to believe we're already here.